Okay. So our, our last talk for this section, for this session, uh, will be given by Liron Cohen, who's co-author Ruben Rowe. And uh, let's see, integrating induction and co-induction via closure operators and proof cycles. Okay, please begin. Um, so yes, thank you. I'm very happy to be the almost last talk for this uh, unusual each car. Um, and uh, I will be telling you about this joint work with uh, Ruben Rowe on uh, a formal system uh, for integrating uh, in inductive and co-inductive reasoning uh, using um, uh, two major frameworks and kind of putting them together. So um, just to put things into context, um, so co-induction is the dual principle of induction. It is essentially the greatest fixed point uh, versus uh, induction being the least fixed point. And it's mainly used for um, reasoning about co-inductive data types, such as uh, infinite streams or trees. And um, while there's a lot of work on co-induction from an algebraic point of view, um, there is some sort of gap between um, the abstract theory of it and the actual use of these principles and uh, the way they are actually applied in practice. So in that sense, uh, co-induction is not um, as uh, well studied or uh, widely supported in uh, proof systems or in uh, formal frameworks. Um, there are, of course, some uh, notable exceptions like uh, the co-camel system and the CERC system. But even then, um, the, the combination of the two principles, the way they interact with one another, is not so intuitive. Uh, because the standard approach for formalizing these uh, principles is to define inductive data via um, some constructors and then co-inductive data uh, via destructors. And um, what we'd like to propose today is an alternative approach that um, is, um, is more, uh, more clearly reveals the duality between the two principles. And our approach is based on two components. Uh, from the semantical perspective, we take a logic that's based on two very simple, very natural closure operators. And from the proof theoretical perspective, we exploit uh, the framework of non-well-founded uh, systems. And the combination of, of both these uh, components is what really enables uh, the intuitive account of both principles. So. Um, let's start with the logic uh, that we call RTCC logic. Um, so our logic is based on a well-known uh, uh, extension of first order logic called the transitive closure logic. And transitive closure logic is basically an extension um, that uh, uh, adds to first order logic just one operator that we call here TC. And this operator takes some formula phi and two distinct variables and looks as, at this phi as defining a relation with respect to those variables and then taking the transitive closure of that relation. So uh, intuitively, um, uh, this formula should be uh, seen as kind of an infinite disjunction. Um, here we take the reflexive form of the formula. So to say that S and T stand in the transitive closure of some formula means that it's either the case that S equals T or S and T stand in the relation phi, or there is some intermediate value uh, that, that phi connects S to and it's connected to T and, and, and so forth. And uh, more formally, uh, we say that this uh, relation S and T standing the transitive closure of phi 
if there is a finite sequence of elements, of elements, uh, the first of which is S, and the final one is T, and uh, every um, every two uh, consecutive elements are related via phi. So we say that S and there is a phi path, a finite phi, phi path between S and T. So what do we do? Uh, we take this very simple, very intuitive logic and we extend it with a dual operator, uh, the semantic dual, that, um, uh, which we call TC op. And this TC op now uh, states that S and T stand in the TC op of some relation if there's an infinite sequence of elements starting from S such that uh, we proceed via phi path of, of phi steps and we might reach T at some uh, finite state or we can just keep going forever, right? So intuitively we say it's either the case that we reach T, which is the TC case, or we can keep going and um, keep applying phi steps uh, uh, on those elements in this sequence. And um, this uh, operator is essentially a greatest fixed point of the same composition operator that the TC operator is the least fixed point of, right? So this is the, our single extension, one single uh, constructor. And um, why? Why is this the logic we chose to look at? So first of all, it's really a minimal extension of first order logic that has this intuitive semantics. And it's, it's a special case of, of fixed point logic, such as the mu calculus, and it's much simpler, right? We do not need um, the syntactic restriction on, uh, of uh, monotonicity, and um, the syntax is simpler, and um, we get a very, very natural compact framework. But despite the fact that it's so um, minimal, uh, it is highly expressive. So um, uh, a theorem from uh, Avron shows that the TC fragment, the transitive closure fragment of the system already uh, captures all finitary inductive definitions just using the TC operator, right? So despite the fact that it's a very simple operator, it has a lot of expressive power, uh, obviously coming at the price of being inherently incomplete, uh, but at least uh, practical. Uh, what's more is that uh, we get from this uh, logic a uniform way to express both induct inductive and co-inductive definitions, right? So we have these two constructors, uh, but uh, we do not need to have a kind of a family of system that are indexed by some set of inductive or co-inductive definitions and, and, and discuss them collectively. Uh, for example, such as system, uh, um, the LKID system of uh, Brotherson and Simpson. So we really get a uniform uh, framework uh, that um, might be better for certain aspects of automated reasoning. And the other component that, that we particularly care about is that um, we get this framework that has these two constructors, but these two constructors share the same underlying signature, the first order signature, right? So we essentially get a very easy way, a very natural way to kind of um, uh, mix together the inductive and in, uh, co-inductive uh, components in the logic. Okay. So uh, before we move to the proof theory uh, component, I would just like to give an example of perhaps the most well-known example of uh, co-inductive data types, uh, that of streams. So we take the standard uh, underlying signature of uh, nil and cons, 
uh, from which we can define the standard uh, constructs of uh, the head and tail of some lists. And what I want to show, uh, well, the graphs of, uh, of the head and tail. And it, it is then very easy using our two operators to define the set of lists, for example. So the first one is the set of, of finite lists by just saying, um, so we take the, the inner formula is basically a tail decomposition. So when we, we take the transitive closure of a tail decomposition, so if we start from some um, sigma and we end up reaching nil, that means that sigma is a finite list because we keep decomposing the tail finitely many times and reach nil. If we want to then extend and also consider uh, both finite and, and infinite list, we can simply take the TC off of that same formula. And if we just want to consider streams, just the infinite list, what do we do? We simply say, well, the, the inner formula simply becomes we decompose the tail, but we also require that at every step of this decomposition, we never reach nil, right? So that essentially um, forces us to be in the case of an infinite sequence and not uh, of the uh, not the finite one. Um, okay, so here are, are the definitions for uh, list streams. But what's perhaps most more interesting is that we can also very easily define relations on those uh, elements. So for one, we can define the relation of just one stream being an extension of the other. So to define that, we just uh, we, we, we just mean um, we say that uh, sigma one is um, a result of prepending some finite sequence, uh, some finite sequence to sigma two, right? Uh, and the finite is actually a, a result of using the TC operator here. We can then use this extension relation to define a very interesting relation, the substream relation, meaning uh, that uh, sigma two is a substream of sigma one. And what do we mean here? Uh, we basically mean that sigma one contains all the elements of sigma two in that same order, but it might also contain some other elements, right? So for that, uh, so we need for that um, uh, uh, to also have a pairing function in our uh, signature, but that's not a main concern. And then how do we define it? We simply say um, at every phi step, what we do is we take sigma one and sigma two, we decompose sigma two here to take the head, this a and some tail and for sigma one which is the x one here we only require it to be an extension some extension of that same a with with some tail right so if we keep kind of decomposing those steps uh we'll end up with uh sigma one being um uh, sigma two being a substream of sigma one and what's interesting about this formalization is that uh, this property of being a substream is a property that requires uh, mixed uh, induction and co-induction, right? Because um, the uh, outer constructor is TC op, but here we use the extension relation that's defined using the TC operator. And we'll come back to that. Okay. So let's consider the proof theory. So first of all, just uh, uh, some background on non-well-founded proof theory. Uh, so in non-well-founded proof theory, uh, we do not consider uh, proofs to be finite trees anymore, but uh, proofs can be infinite as long as we have to be able to trace some elements that could be formulas or terms and we need to be able to trace those elements such that at certain point, 
uh, in the proof, there is some notion of progression. And by progression, we mean that at each infinite path um, in this uh, infinite proof tree, there has to be some notion of infinite descent. So there has to be some trace that decreases in some sense. And uh, this condition that's called the global trace condition is an uh, omega regular property, uh, which is decidable. Um, and since we are looking uh, for a, a formal proof system that's uh, effective or implementable, if you wish, uh, we will restrict ourselves to the uh, subsystem of only cyclic proofs. So a cyclic proof is just those that can be represented by a finite regular proofs that possibly, uh, that's possibly uh, a cyclic graph, right? So how do we get soundness for these types of systems? We assume for a contradiction that we have some counter model for the conclusion, right? But then, because we have local soundness for each of the rules, we get this infinite set of uh, infinite sequence of counter models through this infinite branch. And what we do is we map those um, models into some well founded um, set. And because we have this uh, restriction, the global trace condition that requires us to have some uh, progression points, infinitely many progression points, we get that uh, we end up with an infinitely descending chain in a set that we um, assume to be well-founded, right? Which is of course a contradiction. So that is uh, kind of how non-well-founded uh, proof systems uh, work and their soundness. But why, why did we choose to use them? So um, first of all, uh, we wanted to uh, get a complete uh, proof system. And uh, the expressivity of this logic does not allow us to have a finite proof system for it. So we had to look uh, at the infinitary ones. And, and uh, such systems are known to have cut-free completeness results uh, uh, for the mu calculus, for variants of Kleene algebras, uh, and so forth. Uh, it also enables us um, to kind of improve our proof search um, uh, of, uh, when, when searching for inductive properties, because a key component in these systems is that uh, we do not have to supply the induction invariant um, in advance. So it doesn't have to be explicit and can be somewhat inferred um, along the cycles of the proof. Um, they, they are also very useful in uh, verifications uh, because it uh, kind of uh, separates um, the soundness component uh, from the termination. And um, they're also a very useful tool for studying the connection between explicit and implicit induction, right? So these uh, non well founded systems are often called systems for implicit induction. Um, and uh, there are various um, fields uh, in which uh, this relation has been explored uh, in arithmetic, in system for inductive definition, and so forth. And what we want to show is the, that uh, these benefits can also be exploited uh, in the co-induction uh, realm. So what is our, our infinitary proof system? Okay, so it's a very simple one. We take a, a sequence um, we take um, an extension of the sequence uh, style system for first order logic, LK, uh, Gensin style, and we add basically six new rules for the two operators. So here are the three new rules for the TC operators. So the first one simply state that it's reflexive. The second one, which we call, we call the step rule, is a form of transitivity. We say that if we have phi step from S to R, and then we can proceed 
uh, with a, a finite list of steps from uh, R to T, then we can join them together. And the last one, um, which we call the unfolding rule, is the one that says that um, uh, TC of phi between S and T uh, has basically two cases to consider, one in which S and T are equal, and one in which we have one first step and then some TC for the rest, right? And um, I'm omitting here context, and also uh, Z has to be fresh in this uh, final rule, but um, those are not so critical for the moment. Uh, so here are the three rules for the TC operator. And, he, and, and here are the three rules for the TC op operator, which uh, at first glance, you might find that to be very confusing because uh, they have the exact same form for the ones for the TC operator. But the difference between these rules uh, is in the way in which the decomposition of the formulas is traced in our uh, infinite uh, style proof system. So in the inductive case, in the TC case, we trace the TC formulas on the left-hand side uh, using the unfold rule, which uh, gives us the progression point. And for TC op, we trace on the right-hand side also giving us a progression point because we move from this list from S to T to this list from, from R to S. And here to demonstrate is a very, very simple proof. All we are proving here is that uh, TC is contained in TC op. And um, this is a cyclic proof, right? We have a cycle because this is not an axiom. It's exactly the same sequence that we have here on the bottom. And the reason it's a valid cycle is because we have this trace, for example, of the TC formulas on the left-hand side that has this progression point. This is the progression point. We move with the unfolding rule and we progress, right? So we can look at this proof as an inductive proof of this statement. But we can also trace that very same cycle using the TC op formulas. So if we do that, we still have a progression point, right? Because we use the step rule for TC op. And this cycle allows us to look at this proof as a co-inductive proof, right? So this proof has only one cycle. The question is how we choose to look at it. And this proof kind of exemplifies how naturally co-induction and induction uh, can be captured in our uh, system. So we have shown that this uh, system is sound and cut-free complete. Um, completeness is achieved using the standard constructions for non-well-founded uh, proof system. And soundness, um, there is a subtlety there um, because for the code traces, we do not uh, use the method that I described before of getting a infinitely descending chain, but we actually construct an infinite sequence that witnesses uh, the TC op formula that we consider to be uh, to, to not hold in the counter model. So we get the contradiction in a different way. And um, here is another example of a proof that I do not imagine you'll uh, digest in the, the, the next couple of minutes. But uh, this is a proof of a very simple property saying that uh, the substream relation that we discussed earlier uh, is transitive, right? So if Y is a substream of X and Z is a substream of Y, then Z is a substream of X. And this is a very simple property, but formally proving this property is known to be hard because of the mixture between induction and co-induction. So for example, in Basil's uh, PhD thesis, this uh, proof required some heavy co-algebraic meta theory. Whereas in our framework, uh, um, what I hope you can at least get from all the colors and the cycles, is that we have two kind of small inductive lemmas that are rather trivial. 
And the proof itself has two overlapping co-inductive cycles, one uh, on the right and one on the left. But um, that is all. We do not need any kind of uh, further algebraic investigation. Um, so to summarize uh, what we uh, plan to do next with this system, so first on the semantic perspective, we would like to uh, fully characterize the expressiveness of the system. And uh, that is uh, quite hard because there isn't really, um, uh, it's not even clear how to formalize that. Um, uh, we're looking at um, um, some definitions from automata theory, from co-algebra, but uh, it's not as clear as for the inductive case. Another uh, goal of ours is to uh, develop the structural proof theory for this uh, framework. Um, um, for example, uh, there are various ways to achieve syntactic cut elimination for non-well-founded system. Uh, uh, for example, for linear logic uh, that we think uh, can be easily adapted to our systems, uh, to our system, but uh, they might not preserve regularity of proofs. So there might uh, need to be some additional requirement there. And uh, last, we would like to implement the system and kind of explore its capabilities, uh, in particular, uh, the potential for verifying uh, program correctness against specifications of co-inductive and inductive properties. And um, uh, looking at uh, systems and programs that op operate on um, co-inductive data. Um, so that's all I wanted to say, and uh, thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your very, very nice and clear presentation. Uh, questions, anyone? Yes. Uh, uh, the host of... Right, uh, Stepan, please, I think you can speak now, just a moment. Yes, yes. do you hear me? Yes, please ask yes. your question. Yeah, so thanks for a very nice talk, I really enjoyed it. I just have some more traditionally complexity questions. So um, maybe I just uh, missed this during the talk. What is the uh, com complexity of the derivability problem in the infinitary system? And what is for the cyclic fragment? So do you have any ideas about that? Should Sorry, be decidable, I think. But uh, what, what level of arithmetic complexity does it have? So um, the global trace condition is decidable using some Vuki automata, right? Uh, is that what you're referring to? I did, I did not quite hear. Um... No, 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 no. I mean, just if you have a formula uh, in this uh, extended language, what is the complexity of his durability question? Not about checking the conditions, but about uh, oh, seeking um, the derivation. It should be do, quite high, I think. But uh, Yes, I do know that, that's exactly what I wanted to say. I do not have a good answer to this question. Um, that's one of the things we would like to further explore, but it's not clear how to uh, get a good, um, good bound there. So it should be by one, one on top, I believe, or something like that. But is there a state about? And the other question is that the circular system is, it should be, in a sense, it should be sigma one zero. So uh, it should be incomplete. And um, yeah, but it should be decidable. Okay. So there's no problem. yes, it cannot be complete, right? Because it's an effective system and, and the, yes, yes, just yes. the TC fragment uh, already can capture the natural numbers. So. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's definitely it's, not complete. It already includes first order, so it's already undecidable. So it's... What do you mean? What what's decidable? Well, what, you, 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 it is, it, as I understand, it's all built upon first order logic. That's right. And first order logic itself is undecidable, so it's De definitely. Yep, yep. So thought you're in the problem. <laughs> Any other? Uh, yeah, yep. Okay. Any other Thank questions? Yeah. Uh, while we wait maybe for another, I, uh, 
uh, I, I, I have a question. So I can really appreciate the ability to avoid monotonicity uh, in this uh, weaker sort of notion of fixed point, co-fixed point. Uh, they're, they often seem rather ad hoc and very tricky to work with. Uh, but it's clear the logic is somewhat limited and it, I'm trying to understand the nature. So many questions that could be asked in this logic seem to be about say reachability style questions. That's right. Um, can you, on the other hand, capture notions say like simulation and process calculus or winning strategies in game theory? Um, so the answer is yes, uh, to an extent. Uh, meaning that um, uh, we like to refer to it as uh, we, we capture uh, induction and co-induction in practice. Uh, so um, if you think of them as least fixed points, uh, so we capture them up to omega, right? Mm. Um, so anything uh, beneath uh, omega, is, we can um, formulate uh, in our system. Uh, both induction uh, and co-induction, uh, but we can't get higher. So we can't uh, um, discuss uh, um, some abstract uh, induction, uh, inductive and co-inductive systems uh, that uh, are considered algebraically, but um, uh, we have that restriction. And I should also mention that um, due to the kind of simplicity of the operators, uh, obviously it comes at some price, right? So the trade-off of course is, is in the formalization. So you must at times for the properties that you mentioned, uh, so you must pay the price in the formalization, but you can then work with them in a, in a framework that is uh, perhaps uh, simpler. Okay. I have another quick question if no one else does. Maybe it's more comment, so I see no other questions. Um, it seems like a natural place to apply this kind of work would be to finite state machines, trying to um, recast the traditional kinds of questions about uh, is a language empty, uh, containment of languages, also dealing with Buki automaton. When you're in a finite set of states with finite transitions, a lot of Infinite proofs, in fact, will be fine, I guess, if you observing loops, for example. Right. So we have looked into a bunch of examples on uh, kind of uh, things related to state transitions. Uh, as you mentioned, reachability is a very easy and, uh, um, property that we can formulate. And it's also very natural. We can, um, we can use the same operator basically uh, TC or TC op to talk about both the memory structure and the state transition. So they offer us a uniform way to discuss both and kind of connect them also. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have looked at a bunch of those examples, but uh, we are still, um, we're still hoping to first implement the system so that we can play with it in, a, in an easier way than actually writing down all the proofs on paper. Yes, yes, most, most sensible indeed. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So in, in the event there's no other questions, I'd like to thank you very much again. And I'll applaud for everyone. <laughs> Thanks.